to address us about issues of different faith and science and ideas and the, the evolution of ideas. Uh, Professor Kave, as I told you before, he's the first supporter of our Nitzutzot program. It started in his, in his reign as a president. And I started my con contact with Barilan during his presidency. Actually, he was in the committee that interviewed me to be accepted. I think he regrets it till this day. And uh, now, now he's, he has been a friend the whole time since I came to Barilan. He was a very close friend and always with a smile and always trying to help as much as he could in every aspect of our activity. So, Professor Kave, please. Good evening and bon appetit. Very difficult to talk to people that eat, but I will try. You know that the blood goes to the stomach instead of the brain, but <laughs> Uh, it's a very, what I choose, Rabbi, hello, Rabbi Shabtai Rappaport asked me to talk about something and I will not bother you with physics and so on, but it's connected. So from the introduction and probably you will talk about the conference, I choose to talk about something that probably many of you know in one way or another so I will try to summarize, and I picked up the title The Conflicts Between Science and Faith and Their Solution in Light of the New Discoveries. Which means the conflicts wouldn't be solved only they were solved because science changed. People don't change so quickly. So we'll see a few examples and learn something from that. And uh, the history of these conflicts, there are many examples, I will not uh, spend all the time about it, only a few, between science and faith, uh, contradictory and so on. Over my many years of being a scientist, I met so many scientists with arrogant statements and without any uh, foundation but this is part of it. So, what I would like to say, in the history, if you look back to learn from conflicts, this is what I wanted, to learn from them, you can see that any, basically, conflict in the past, they didn't have any scientific basis, according to the development of science, or any religious deep uh, foundation, it was like a frightening uh, scientific uh, a new effect which some leaders thought uh, it's dangerous to us, so they made some statements. So let's start from the first conflict which is really important for students and others to study from it. The first one was the first great scientist as a physicist was Galileo Galilei. He lived between 1564 to 1643. It's uh, the modern physics started with him. And he is called the father of modern science. And what does it mean? It's important. And look, I was 18 years as a professor and I know many professors and different uh, fields and the time before uh, Galileo and even after some philosophical approaches were considered as scientific statements and this was problematic it is a problematic because you cannot prove it it's only if you are talking in a more uh, passionate way or so on but so he was the first one who said that the scientific fact must be determined only by an experimental experiment. If the experiment says something and fights something, 
This is something which we have to actually follow as a scientific rule. So he built a telescope in his time, and uh, I, I went a few times to see it. Some uh, part of it is still, uh, until today, a genius way. Today, of course, we have technology and so on, but in that time it was outstanding. And what was the purpose of the telescope? To look over the stars and the sky and the sun and everything. And he came up with a statement that all my 12 grandchildren from all ages quote as a simple thing. But in that time it became as a revolution. And he said that from his observation, our, the earth that we live on is revolving around the sun. Wow! This was against the belief of that time because every, many people thought that we are the center of the universe and everything is revolving around us. And I don't say that some psychologists would say it's some kind of an egoistic approach that every egoist thinks that all the world is revolving around him. But this was the, the approach without any scientific uh, uh, proof. So this was the first collapse or the first, I would say, uh, I mean, clash between uh, a religious approach and Galileo. And the church actually asked him in that time to stop talking about it. They didn't allow him to talk about it. And since he was a scientist, a physicist, he continued to measure and to talk about it. And he was put after a sentence into prison. The first time in the history that a scientist was put to prison, not because a political statement, which also is allowed to do, a freedom of speech, not, not to go into it, not in the university, not to the students, but outside, at least. So, because uh, I think that someone shouldn't put to his students his personal ideas or political ideas. This is something which is not absolutely perfect, but not, let not go into it. So basically, this was something which is called uh, a clash uh, which was influenced everything. And let me quote Galileo, which I was very impressed when I read it. And he said something which is a very deep statement. But with all the suffering, he believed in what he did. He said, the scriptures, the scripture is meant to teach us to move towards heaven and not how heaven is moving. If you think about it, it's, some would say it is a little bit what we call a chutzpah, too much, uh, how do you dare to say something like that? But this is a deep statement to try to separate between a religious belief or approach and scientist approach. So I would say that the interesting that, that Galileo at his view, overview is very similar to a very great, I will talk about him a lot, uh, my synthesis between science and religion came out by studying from a very young age his scriptures and I must say every year I understand them in a different way, which means he is deep and I am shallow, and this is very important. And he says the following, it is Maimonides, the Rambam, and look what Galileo said, the Rambam said it 30, 360 years before Galileo. And very, very similar ideas. And the statement of Maimonides, about the conflict between biblical scripture and science, it's my translation, so again I, be, I beg him forgiveness. We have to accept, Maimonides said, the Bible text whenever there is a conflict between the biblical text and science, unless the scientific fact is fully accepted by all scientists by the experiments, yes? 
And then we have to understand the biblical text as basically the Bible. However, if it's not accepted absolutely as a scientific fact, we have to say, look what it says. And uh, the Jewish rabbis didn't like it in the beginning. We have to say, he says, that the scripture, we have to understand it in an allegoric way, not to explain it as a simplistic way. Which means it's written because we are human beings and God gave us the Bible, but it doesn't mean a word to word which we can explain the science. If it is something, a scientific fact that we know and the scripture says differently, it means the scripture must be explained in a different way. Sorry? I will give you all of that. Yes, of course. Yeah. Okay. I must say, if that advice would be taken by scientists and religious people, then I, I didn't have anything what to say. There were no conflicts. Because the conflict came up because of not understanding that deep, deep statement. Let me just say that even Maimonides had a dramatic personal effect like Galileo. He wasn't put in prison, but his scriptures about describing what a belief is and what does God mean, and that there is an abstract and so on, and the basically his books were burned, which people didn't allow people other people to read it. They were afraid that you will not be a believer anymore. And of course, later on, everyone is quoting him, and he became the greatest, uh, actually, Jewish leader. And let me come to Galileo. On the, in the 21st century, the Pope Paulus VI apologized on behalf of the church for injustice that was done to Galileo. So, eventually, both Galileo and Maimonides, the justice was done by slowly, slowly for people to understand that basically what is science and what is basically a, a belief. And believe me, until today, I was uh, uh, in many, many communities, still some people, I don't want to mention where and what, don't understand it, and this creates a lot of tension. Let's go to the next great scientist after Galileo, was Newton. He lived between 1642 uh, to 1727, and he is defined as one of the most important scientists ever, and uh, a great scientist. He began the period which is called in science, classical physics, which in that time it was believed this is, this is the last word of science. Whenever you hear the last word of science, means it's only because we are humans and we don't live forever. <laughs> Basically, and then there is no doubt that uh, my students sometimes understand much better than me. This is how the evolution of understanding goes. So, this is classical physics. He formulated the laws of uh, uh, gravitation by writing Newton equations or differential equations. I will not go into it. And he wrote a book which became the classical book, Principia Mathematics, which describes the forces between all the bodies all the, in the sky, the stars, and uh, uh, whatever we have, the sun and the earth. And basically, uh, it became a boring I did, I did my career, I started as a mathematician, and then I understood it's very boring to be a mathematician, sorry for some mathematicians here, and I moved to physics where I understood that after Newton there's something more interesting, I will come to it. So basically, and this is the problem which I'm saying to many friends from my experience of life. When you are a great, when you have a great success, be careful, because the glory can bring you a disaster by making statements because you think, wow, I am so and so, so now I am allowed to say so and so, and this is, and it, it, it creates a lot of catastrophes. 
So in the glory of Newton, that everyone thought is the god of science, a problem came out. Basically, Newton says, if all the stars, because of gravitational forces between two stars and two bodies, everything is basically all the stars and the Earth are basically attracted to the sun. So he asked the question, why all, basically, all, everything around the sun doesn't collapse? Because they are attracted to the sun. And, okay, the question is nice, but the answer he gave is a chilling answer, really from someone like Newton. He said, and I will explain why he said so, which is more problematic, he said, the, the, the actually all the stars and the earth and all the solar system does not collapse because God is keeping from the solar system not to collapse. Why does it say so? Because he said in his view, and after him, if you can explain by science everything, fantastic. Whenever you cannot explain from science something, probably you must bring in the belief that God is there, and just imagine in the middle of the equations, so you, you put plus God and so on, I mean science is collapsing immediately. So this is basically what he brought, and the period was turned lately, uh, later, a uh, very, very difficult problem, and it is called the God of the gaps. What does it mean, the God of the gaps? If you understand science absolutely, fantastic. When you have a gap in understanding, then God puts it, you put God in. So what happens if you start to understand more and more, the gap is becoming <laughs> is closing and closing, and the place for God becomes less and less. Yes? It's if you go to my room, I have it every month. I have to put so many articles and so on, suddenly I don't find where to put anything. So basically, this is a problem. And uh, that problem created a big, a big philosophical problem, which I'll, I will mention in a moment. And after Newton came up the great mathematician, physicist Laplace, and he said that the great Newton missed something. It didn't take into account the forces between the stars. It's correct all the stars are attracted to the sun, but there are also attraction between the stars. You write the equations for all the forces, which is very, very complicated, but Laplace was a genius. He solved what is called the Laplace equation, and guess what? The solar system is stable. Wow! So what Newton missed, he actually did it. So what happened later? If Newton, uh, Laplace said it, so he solved the problem. Now was as an historical meeting between Napoleon and Laplace, which is basically uh, very difficult to understand the prime minister or a president of a state having such a discussion nowadays. But Napoleon is asking, basically, Laplace, Laplace, where is God in your equations? Because he solved everything. Newton said, God is keeping us not to collapse. And the most, one of the most arrogant answers of a scientist was associated by Laplace. And he said the following, God, we don't need him. Science can explain everything. So what was the logic? The God of the gaps. There is no gap. We don't need God. And this created a very terrible meeting. I'm always praying to God, thank God, I was not actually born in that time. Because to be a scientist was not a pleasure, and so on. So, basically, there is no room for God because we understand everything. That period is also called the deterministic period because according to the philosophy, you write the equations of Laplace and everything of Newton, knowing the, actually the present where all the particles are around us, we can evaluate 
exactly how it evolves in time. So the present is determined once you know uh, the, 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 the uh, once you know the present, you know the future. So the future is determined, basically. And what does it mean that there is no free? What will we have nothing to do? We are robots. You came here because Shabtai have rapport asked you to come, you have robot you are robots, you have no choice, you had to come here. Because uh, we have no free will. But uh, don't uh, don't fall asleep fall asleep, you are not robots. So basically that deterministic period was a terrible and basically it was the scientist actually thought everyone who believes in God is some someone who needs uh, help. And, uh, and, so, and I will not explain all the expressions that were actually given at that time. Yes. And thank God, sorry to say it, but thank God, <laughs> we are after that period. The scientific revolution of the early 20th century, which everything was changed, and I must say, not only everything was changed, it became as a revolution against all what people thought in that time. So let me explain what really happened. When you go to atomic scales to understand what's going on in the electrons and atoms and all of that, it turns out that the Newton formulation is absolutely wrong. It cannot explain the science. It cannot explain science. So, a new theory, which was, I will just mention a few names, probably you heard about them, Max Planck, De Broglie, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, all of them got the Nobel Prize. By geniuses, they brought a new idea. And it's an idea which basically very difficult. Because why? It's against the senses. We were used for many years from Newton and so on and before that everything we have to feel with our senses. And the laws of quantum mechanics are really abstract. We don't understand it. For instance, and I have to put it aside, do you hear what I'm saying? Yes, yes. If you have, let's say, a beam of particles and you have suddenly a wall, of course we know, like my grandchildren, they play with the ball, it will hit the wall and they cannot pass. What really happens if the wall is finite? It turns out when you measure, you find part of it out around it. What does it mean? Because there are no more anymore, the description of particles are wrong. This is, there are waves, and the waves are moving and can go around it. This is a, a really a revolutionary thinking altogether. Not only that, we have an atom. What is an atom? You have a positive charge, the nucleus, and you have an electron with a negative charge. Why the electron does not fall into the positive charge? No one said anymore what Newton said. What? God is keeping the electron not to fall. What is the answer? The electron is not, a, is not a particle. It's a wave. It can be everywhere. I know that it's late, and, uh, but it is difficult if it was early. Quantum mechanics became an abstract description, which means it's a problem only a probability to find a particle everywhere it can be automatically here and here and here and this is why it doesn't revolve it's not a particle and all of that brought brought such uh, a change in our uh, understanding that which means we don't understand and let me just say that we have the uncertainty principle which was called the Heisenberg Uncertainty Principle, which in physics, to say something like that is dramatic. Let me just say the statement. We are not able, not able, it's impossible in principle to measure the position of a particle and its velocity simultaneously. Why? It's an axiom, axiomatic, which means this is something I remember I was a student and I was interviewed by a newspaper and this was many years before I became president to understand that you don't do it because they will, everything you say will say the opposite. And so they quoted me actually that, uh, that I'm saying 
that uh, science became religious. I didn't say something like that. I only said that what happened is that all the conflicts that were in the past, now they're really abolished. So what I would like to say, the, uh, uh, I said to the newspaper that the Eisenberg principle made science, the science to be a modest field, to bring as a concept an uncertainty, not because I don't understand, it's a principle of science. It's an uncertainty built in. This brings you the probability of electron. You have to solve the equations. I will not go into it. But from that comes so much and so many things. So if this was not enough to make a change from Newton, came up Einstein in that period. And Einstein said, uh, look, uh, uh, things which took time and uh, many years I, I, I was lucky that the student of Einstein was my teacher, Professor Yammer in bar -Ilan University, and he told us all the jokes about Einstein that uh, were funny and nice. Uh, one of them, let me just uh, tell you, that uh, Einstein said, uh, I have a proof that one plus one is equal to three. Why? He said, look. When I married my wife, is one plus one. She became pregnant. We are three. So he had jokes. He, he talks about Einstein like being someone that is not serious. But Einstein did a revolution. He started the revolution in 1905. Ten years it took him to explore it, to do what is called the general relativity. And let me just say to you in a, in, in a short, it means from Einstein that to understand what is the distance between two points, it depends on the observer. If the observer is actually moving with a velocity which is very close to the velocity of light, which is the maximum velocity that some, something can move, I mean, the distance depends on his moving and its velocity, which is not understood at all. And if I go on, not only that, uh, uh, the velocity, if you want to measure a velocity, it depends on the velocity of the one who measures it. And so on, everything is relative. And uh, so basically what he says, Einstein, uh, that new, if we summarize, Newton's classical theory of physics collapsed when? When we go to atomic physics and when we go to velocities which are quite high, near to the velocity of light. So all of that, what Newton said, is only in normal velocities and in normal, uh, um, I, I mean, areas, not in uh, atomic physics, which is uh, very important. So what I would like to say, if I sum up, that the century uh, of the new century brought very outstanding diff different views of science and showed us that the past collapse a collisions between science and faith were based either because we didn't understand the science or the religious statement were also without any basis. And let me just quote you again Maimonides that he said after the revolution and he was living 18, 800 years before the revolution he said the following any scientific theory learned from reality may be mistaken because it is formed, it is founded on an ongoing process of knowing the infinite, this infinite information, so you can never know everything, which can never be complete. However, and this is the statement from many religious rabbis, however, the knowledge of God is complete knowledge. It doesn't change and so on. And what happened if you read Maimonides, you cannot go into the laboratory and to do an experiment. You say, wow, from that experiment I have a proof that there is a God. Absolutely not. God is outside science and science cannot say anything about him. And if I don't have much time, we can explore it that many stupid statements were said because people didn't understand what he's saying. So, another 
problem came out. Creation. We know that the world was created. This is how the Bible starts. That God created the universe. Scientists didn't believe in that for many years and said it's impossible. How, what do you mean creation? How can you create something from nothing? If I put my glass here, I took it from here, I put it here. I mean, but from nothing, how, from where did you take all of that energy? So this was basically there are a lot of statements which I will not read because you will not have appetite to eat later. What was said about the third statements of Genesis of the creation? No, it's nonsense and so on. And so on. And I myself, as a religious Jew and a scientist, I worked with many great people. Sometimes I was saying it. And when I said to them the answer of Maimonides, after six years, they came to me, or five years, you know, uh, maybe you're right. <laughs> but uh, this is uh, the common statement. So, if you take the creation, what really happened? So again, look, it was a scientific breakthrough, let me explain from it, in the 20th century again. In 1946, a science called George Gamow, he came out with a theory which is the universe was created from a small ball that was exploded and it was called the Big Bang. The Big Bang is something that was created from a small ball. All the scientists laughed and said this is impossible and this is a mystical way of looking at, at the creation and there is impossible. It's like the Bible said, you need from, from where do you take the energy and so on. So all of that was really something which was ignored. And like happens many times, the breakthrough came in a year which I don't know if I didn't learn it from a rabbi. From time to time I pray to God that thank God that I started physics in 1964, that all the great revolutions in the new area started in 1964. And one of them is, I started, and I just learned it in the physics, was the breakthrough in 1964, was the following. They proved two people created a new telescope, Penzias and Wilson, and they actually measured irradiation from the beginning of the world, the Big Bang, and they actually proved there was a Big Bang and it was a creation and basically measured it. It took time to understand it. It was also until it took time and eventually all the scientists believe today that the world was created. So basically we have to be happy. I mean science and religion they have became friends. There is creation in everything. So I told you on the, in the beginning that I am a visiting professor of Cambridge and my room was very close to the room of Steve Hawking. He was a giant, uh, all the black holes, I will not go into it, otherwise uh, we can spend all night about the black holes. <coughs> and he really was a giant and he wrote, I thought, no, after Newton's statement and uh, Laplace's statement, that's it, the end, look, look what happened. He wrote a book which is called, I don't know if this is the best uh, translation, what I have it, uh, The History of the Shortening of Time. Now? Brief History of Life. Yeah. Kitsu man. And he says the following in his book. He says the following. We know that according to general relativity, time and space go together. So according to Einstein, the time was created in the Big Bang. There was no time. We don't understand it in science. All the science started with the Big Bang, including time. There was no time before it. Time starts from that. So Steve Hawking is asking in his book, if God created the universe, it must have been a, before the Big Bang. But there was no time before Big Bang. 
So how can God be before the Big Bang? And the advertisement of the book was, Steve Hawking proves there is no God. Well, there was a book. So I was privileged to talk to him. And again, I showed him Maimonides. There is uh, scriptures in Cambridge. And I told him that he is wrong. Because according to Maimonides, the paradox is absolutely not a paradox. And let me say why. And the solution of the paradox was the following. Maimonides in his book says, God is an abstract and cannot be described in scientific terms. He calls belief a very strange but an absolutely nice way. He calls belief divine science. Divine science is a belief. We will not achieve divine science only after, until after we study the natural sciences, which means that one has to dwell into the natural sciences to understand that God cannot be described according to the parameters of natural sciences. God cannot be attributed to the concept of time, born in the creation, and is part of the concept of scientific being. As, so just imagine, he said it 800 years before Steve Hawking, that you cannot imagine God connecting him to time. And he said, but in the Bible he said God was, so he said the following, and that the Lord says that he was before the world was created, usually the word was is connected to time, but when it is associated to an abstract God, as well as everything that it comes in mind from his reality, he says, <clears throat> before the world was created, the, uh, then he says that what is said in here was regarding God, it's imaginary time, it cannot be described by God, but that the Bible talks in the way that for us to understand what happens. So I will not go into the, what is writing in, uh, in Moreh Nebuchim, which is uh, explained like a, a teacher for the emb embarrassed people, and by many embarrassed people, unfortunately. And uh, I must say that when I read it a few times to Steve Hawking, he said to me that in the next edition of the book, he will quote Maimonides, saying that according to that, there is no any paradox. He died before it, and the book actually wasn't changed. So what I would like to say is, by finishing up, sorry that I had more than 20 minutes, I will just say that in the last six years, there was a new particle found, which is called the divine particle. It was a controversy what particle created all the mass of the universe. Why was it called a divine particle or a God particle? It's, there is a joke because they said that uh, that God damn particle will not be found. So the author uh, of the newspaper or the, or the article didn't like the word damn, so it became the God particle. But the God particle is now known, and this is a particle which was found, and this is the particle which created the mass of all the unit, what we have on the, ever, the stars and so on. So basically, what we can actually say that from what was found lately is the following, and this was found in what you just imagine, 1964. So the God particle was found, and the man who found it received the Nobel Prize, which is also something uh, Higgs, it's called the Boson X, and he received the Nobel Prize, and uh, certainly so. So according to that, you can write in a scientific way the Bible, Genesis. And in the beginning, God created sky and earth, so you can say, God created the heavens and the earth, what does it mean? At the beginning, there was a big bang, and created, and God created the God particle. The God particle was created, which is responsible for the mass of heaven and earth. So basically, a few hundred years of clashes and so on became into an harmony. 
And let me finish by two statements, one by Einstein and one by Manmonides, that said very clever things for all of us to understand. Einstein said about science and belief, <coughs> science without religion limps. Religion without science is blind. Let's not make an argument what is worse. And this is very much in line of what? The statement of Maimonides. Let me give you the statement about science and faith. It will not be achieved by divine science, which is a belief, until after the natural sciences. And so the Almighty began the act of Genesis before, before giving the laws of the Bible. Which is, this is why the Bible starts with science. And only later it gave us orders what should be done as human beings. Why? Because science, once you understand it, you can understand the greatness of the Creator that did it. So any believer must understand science in order to become closer to God. So instead of conflicts, we can bring science in our help. Thank you. Good.